have a three-part um, kind of talk here. We have a what we did with Docker, and then um, well, we we're, we use everything right now with Chef, but. Since using Docker, it's like, well, why would we want to replace Chef with this? And then uh, future plans using Docker as well. So that's what we're going to touch on. Um, so to kind of kick things off, why Docker kind of came up at Relate IQ. Um, so we had uh, a, our development environment was running on our Mac OS laptop. Um, we basically made our engineers run Cassandra, Mongo, Elasticsearch. Um, some pretty beefy things right on their Mac and new versions come out and then we keep adding to the stack, uh, kind of the middle image here. Um, our stack was growing really, really just out of control. Um, so we had a couple developers get angry with us and the ops team um, where it, you know, we needed to change things drastically. And um, we tried actually doing this a couple of weeks before we started doing the Docker stuff with uh, using Chef Solo, but things didn't go well at all. Um, it was just two different versions. Um, it was going to take too much time to implement. Um, so we, uh, a week before what we had as a hack day at Relate IQ, we had 24 hours to maybe redo this entire environment, just make our developers happy. So as you can see the images here, we wanted to take this hack day, um, use Docker instead of uh, trying it with Chef. Um, use that 24 hours, automate everything as possible as we could, and then eventually make our developers happy, as you can see in the little picture here. Um, and so, real quick, what we want, what we needed to build to actually pull this off. Um, at a minimum, Kafka, Mongo, Redis, Zookeeper, Elasticsearch, and Cassandra. Um, all those, our goal was to get each one of those inside of a container inside Docker, then run that inside of a virtual machine using Vagrant and uh, VirtualBox. And then we also wanted to get uh, all of that, all of our Docker images into a private Docker registry. We actually just were trying to play with that. We didn't really need to use the private registry at all. We could have used a public one, but we just felt more comfortable and it also gives us extra capabilities long term. Um, so, and if we were crushing it um, after like, 20 hours or something like this. Uh, we're going to try and get Storm, Jetty, and Nginx, and then maybe not just deploy it on the Mac laptop, but take that whole environment and just deploy it right to Amazon. Um, so where we got was actually really, really far. We completed all the minimum stuff in about 12 hours. Um, and then after that, we started chipping away at Storm. And we, Storm has like three very complex pieces, so we got rid of that. Uh, that was pretty easy actually to do with Docker. And then we got the Jetty. Uh, then after that, we ran into a couple of issues, but so we'll talk through those. So we basically got all the minimum done and our extra stretch goals as well, all within about, I'd say, 14 hours or so, and then we decided just to go to sleep. <laughs> um, so here's our end product. Um, as you can see, this is a Mac laptop. So we didn't push anything to Amazon. We've got everything working on our Mac laptop um, with, as, Looking from a developer's perspective, they had to run one single command, and that was it. It was called devm start. Um, what this did, and we'll kind of jump in here, um, was basically start this devm inner script and all the containers with it. This is just an image to kind of get you guys thinking about it here. So these orchestration ships, scripts, what we did with them. So we had two major com components, and we blog a little bit more about this in, in a little uh, and some detail if you guys have any more questions, but the dev env outer, so what the developer really saw was just three commands, an up, an update, and an SSH. That script um, basically controlled Vagrant and then also kicked off the inner script, uh, the shell script here. The inner one did most of the magic. It contained and orchestrated bringing up all the different containers and how to link them together. Uh, and we'll show that in a second. So you can see there's an example of like our start command or our update command. Um, the update's nice just because it allows our whole, our developer, a new developer, go and get the entire branch, uh, pull down any images, and then the latest code if we make changes. Then just real quick, um, this is kind of consistent Docker file. Um, this is very much the same as across all of our scripts. It was really uh, easy to build these. As you can see, uh, this is almost a complete Docker file. But the thing to mention here is that um, the one thing that we want to point out with the Docker file is starting processes within the container. Um, the we ended up using a start script instead of just you know starting. I think this one's here is Cassandra. Um, 
And the reason for that is if we need to do prioritization, say Hadoop, for instance, Hadoop, you need to run SSH daemon before you can actually run Hadoop so, because it uses SSH to talk to its, uh, its other nodes. Um, for instance, for that, we use a supervisor. So that gives you your capability, just something to point out there. So we ran into two things that we were kind of trying to figure out when we built this environment. One was the networking and port forwarding. This has got a little complex, but for those of you that are new to it, as you can see, all little arrows on the right-hand side here. Um, you, we started with the, the Docker container itself. Like, so first thing you have to do is expose a port. In, our, in this case, it was 9,999. Then you have to tell Docker to expose it. And you can use the source and destination, which is critical. Then expose it to Vagrant, and then all the way out to your local host. So to get to that MongoDB UI, there's quite a bit of steps there. So that was a little bit tricky, but as soon as we got used to it, it was cake after that. One other thing that we had, which we've kind of crossed this off, now with the linking feature uh, within Docker, it replaced a script called Pipework, which we originally used when we gave this presentation. Um, but now with Docker links, that's been replaced, so we've updated here. We even we have our new code on the repository as well. So what Docker links allowed us to do was, we had Zookeeper and Kafka, which Kafka uses Zookeeper to store like its offsets and knows where it's at. So we needed those two containers to talk to each other. So we ended up using Pipework, and well now links to set up a network bridge in between the con two containers. And then that allowed uh, us to basically put in like a static IP and allow the containers to talk to each other, which is great. Um, so the first thing with Docker, or with the links, and I think there's gonna be another talk here too, is make sure you name it first, and then you can take that name and attach it with a link. And now those two containers know about each other, which is fantastic. Um, we're also gonna plan on moving like clusters inside and using clusters, this is a great thing just to keep, a, um, keep an eye on is use links to create clusters of containers if you haven't played with them yet. So best practices, um, what kind of what we found in the end, just real quick, was we found having a consistent location with data and logs was critical. Um, we actually just store them within the VM, but you can actually go all the way outside and store the data and logs on your Mac if you really wanted to on the host. Um, but we really like the option of just getting rid of your entire environment and starting completely fresh if needed. Um, so that's just one thing to point out. Also, don't end with tailing. You want, if you want to stop a, a Docker container, you want to end with a foreground execution. Uh, just makes it shut down a little bit easier. Um, the 42 layers, as you guys mentioned, I think previously, we ran into that a couple times. Uh, just keep in mind that Dockerfile can only run 42 layers. I think that's going to be uh, removed in future versions from what we hear. So that's awesome. And then up Vagrant RAM by default. So that's it with the best practice, and we'll kind of get into, well, why didn't we use Chef Solo to, to do this in the first place? Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to cover is, uh, you know, after using Docker for a while, uh, we had a lot of fun in the hack day. And it just started really uh, turning some, some wheels in our head, thinking, well, there's some stuff that, uh, well, we use Chef, as John said, and, and there's some stuff about Chef that, that we don't love. Um, we really actually do like Chef a lot. Uh, but there's some things that really start to, to bother us, uh, and I'm going to go over some of those things. Um, and it says replace, uh, and it's really replace parts of Chef. It's not necessarily replace everything. Like clearly, Docker doesn't do everything Chef does at this point. Uh, so here's four things that, that we think Docker does better, uh, at least for us. So go into that. Uh, so dynamic configuration. Uh, so Chef's all about configuration, and it's all about being able to do, to, configure things in any way you could possibly ever want, and then some. Uh, and as such, it has an extremely complex uh, configuration system, ability to create these attributes that you can override in 15 different ways, literally. You've got default attributes, and force default attributes, and overrides, and force overrides, and automatic attributes. And you multiply that by cookbooks, and uh, recipes, and environments, and roles. And it gives you utmost power which you might need, but if you don't, uh, it can cause you headaches in trying to debug things. Uh, and so for the situations when you don't need that, Docker files can be a, a lot simpler to work with. Uh, they're definitely less powerful, uh, but when you're looking at a Docker file, 
it's all there. It's, mu it's very self-contained. It's not referencing some other recipe, which is referencing some other attribute file, which is referencing, you, know, like, you don't have to go look in a million different places to, to figure out just where you're getting your configuration from. Uh, it really is going to encourage you to use environment variables a lot for your, your configuration. Uh, we've sort of seen that there's some trends towards that in a lot of, of different ways with Heroku and other things. Uh, and the using environment variables has limitations, but again, it's sort of an explicit, you can always know what the value is. Uh, and especially given with Docker, uh, when you're building a Docker file, you can, uh, every step of a Docker file is cached uh, as a separate image, and you can go ahead and spin up a container at any point during that build process and see just what the environment is. You can simulate commands, you can do whatever you need to do. Uh, it makes debugging the build scripts very, very nice and very not painful. Uh, so, uh, next, external dependencies. Uh, so, these aren't solved by Docker, uh, but they certainly weren't solved by Chef either. And, and the experience uh, in Chef tends to be that a lot of cookbooks, if you go out there, a lot of community cookbooks, a lot of the pra uh, you know, tutorials, anything you find is can have some lines like, oh, grab an external file from some you know, Redis's uh, website or grab an, the, the, down, the installer from this other website, wherever it might be. Uh, and it grabs it, downloads it, uncompresses it as needed, whatever it might need to do. Uh, and with Chef, uh, if you use it in, there's lots of ways to use Chef, but if you use it in the, a lot of the ways that are described in tutorials and whatnot, or uh, if you're using their Chef client to actually bootstrap new nodes from scratch, uh, what you're going to be doing is running every command in your uh, Chef recipe when you bootstrap a new node. And that means you're going to be re-downloading that file from wherever you have it. So if you're using the default locations, you're going to be downloading it from some external place. A lot of people are going to then have to set up some infrastructure to get those files in-house. That's not necessarily solved by Docker. You still may want those external files in-house, uh, but as I'll, as I'll show, uh, Docker, you're going to be building an image when you build those, uh, when you actually build a Docker file, you're building an image. And so when you download that file during the build process and uncompress it, install it, whatever you might need to do, it's there. It's in the image. You can ship that. When you're shipping that off, you're just shipping your images off uh, and it's there. It's in. You don't have to worry about when you're spinning up a new node under, oh my gosh, we're under a bunch of load. We need a bunch of new web nodes. We need a bunch of new database nodes. Quick, spin up nodes, right? Uh, with Chef, you have to worry, okay, if you didn't follow all your best practices, if your file version changed, if the URL no longer is valid, uh, your node won't start. Uh, with Docker, if you successfully built that image, you're going to be able to start it. Uh, and so that, that's quite a bit of peace of mind. What we've seen a lot of is people starting to use Chef to build those images in the first place. You know, you use the Chef cookbook. It's great to have your configuration as code for sure. Use that, provision a node, but then take an image of that so that you can still have this image that you can spin up a bunch of n new nodes as needed and not have to worry about that bootstrap process. Uh, all right, and then uh, configuration changes create an inconsistent state. So uh, with Chef, uh, this is another one of those things where like, there are probably a lot of use cases out there where you wouldn't want to you know, restart your services or basically redeploy your nodes. Uh, and you would want to have a node, long running node, make some configuration changes to how you want things to work in your, your Chef recipe. You can push it out uh, and then however you manage to get Chef Client to run, whether you have it running as a background process on all your nodes or not, uh, it's going to go ahead and, and download the new cookbooks and it's going to apply those changes. Uh, and that, that works reasonably well, but there's a lot of situations in which if you didn't perfectly address uh, things like removals, now you have nodes in different states. So if you install monitoring service, you know, monitoring agent A, you know, uh, and you put in your recipe, deploy, to, deploy some nodes, now they have monitoring agent A, and then now you want to switch to monitoring agent B, you have two choices. Uh, you can, the first thing you're going to want to do is, oh, I just want to remove this from my recipe, and I want to deploy this. And if you do that, uh, now you have monitoring agent A and B in all of your running nodes, uh, because you didn't tell it to stop A, you didn't tell it to remove A, any of, the, any of those things. 
Uh, and so then you basically have two choices. You can ad hoc a address all your running nodes with something like NFSSH, lots of tools for that, and actually go stop that service. Now, if you just stop that service, you could be in trouble because perhaps you forgot to actually remove it. And so if it reboots, it's going to come back again. Uh, and so what you really should do is actually tombstone it. You should write into your recipe, we no longer use monitoring agent A. And so over time, you're going to build up a lot of, of cruft in your, in your uh, recipes of all the things you used to do just because you had some existing nodes that you wanted to keep working. Um, and so uh, what, what people end up doing again, this is another reason to build images, and then when you come up with a new configuration, do some rolling upgrades and make sure that all of your images, all of your nodes out there are on the same image. <clears throat> with Docker, it's very, it very much encourages that behavior, right? So when you're making configuration changes, and lots of times it's going to be near the end of your Docker file, uh, first of all, to build it, it's going to be very fast because all of the previous steps have been cached. Uh, so the build's very quick, and then when you push out that, that new uh, image to, or pull it down on your nodes, that new image is going to have a very small delta, and so your configuration changes come down. And then, uh, depending on which talk line you're on, if you saw the, the zero downtime uh, push stuff that, I uh, forget who it was demoed that, uh, you're going to be able to, do, to create some for form of architecture where you can spin up the new node, attach it to whatever load balancer, Apache, Hyproxy, Nginx, whatever it might be, then bring down the old node. And now you have zero downtime deploys, and you, your running containers are all consistent across the board. Um, and the instant restarts really make that uh, quite uh, possible and, and nice. So, and, the, and you know, it's easier then to be disciplined. And if all of your nodes are really identical, uh, you have a lot less to worry about in life. And, and that means not just all of your nodes in prod, it's all of your nodes in test, all of your nodes in your dev environment, across the board, they're identical. And, and that gives you a lot of peace of mind. And then finally, uh, the development process. Uh, so with Chef, the, the development process can be kind of painful. Um, you know, if you have an error, put a, some form of, some syntax error somewhere in your script, or you mistype the URL to the external resource you were downloading, or it's not there anymore, whatever it might be, uh, you make an error. Uh, you don't know it yet, but you're going to go and you want to test out your, your, your chef recipe. Uh, so you go ahead and you spin up a new virtual machine somewhere. Hopefully you're using you know, Vagrant or something like that to get a reasonably quick new virtual machine to, to spin up. Wait for it to boot up. You know, that's a minute, uh, easily, usually. Um, and then you're going to run all those steps in the Docker, uh, sorry, in the chef recipe uh, that were before the, the point at which you made a mistake. And then finally gets to the mistake and it errors. You're like, crap. Uh, what do I do? So at this point, you have two choices. Uh, you're going to take the easy way out, probably, and you're going to just fix up the, the mistake you made, and you're going to rerun that, that you're going to reprovision that existing instance. Now, at this point, if you did that, you have a decent chance of having created a working chef recipe, but you're not 100% sure. Uh, reason being that sometimes the previous steps getting run a second time uh, could, there could have been a timing issue. There could have been a lot of different scenarios where if you were to go start on a base empty image again and run your entire cookbook, it won't work. Um, so if you really want to do it right, what you're going to do is you're going to kill, you had one error, you're going to kill off that VM, boot it up again, wait a minute, run the whole thing again, download every, you know, if, if the first step of your, your process is download a 400 megabyte file, which it very likely is in certain circumstances, or a 100 megabyte file, whatever it might be, you're going to be waiting for that download every time you make a mistake in the last step of the process. Uh, with Docker, Docker builds, uh, again, it's snapshotting every step of that way in your command, or sorry, in your Docker file. And so if you make a mistake, uh, you'll get an error right away, uh, and then you will fix it, change it. Uh, you'll rebuild it, uh, and when you rebuild that Docker file, you're starting again from a known blank slate, but it caches everything that worked up to that point. So that download, that 400 megabyte download, you don't have to do that again. And so the, the iteration process of actually getting working uh, repeatable Docker files and working images that you can deploy wherever you want is a lot faster uh, in, in Docker. And so again, this, this also, this is another one of those cases where Docker's simplicity versus Chef 
can win out. And but even and sometimes simplicity here actually means just like lack of features, right? Like it doesn't do everything Chef does. So you're going to be much more encouraged to be creating a Docker file for one purpose, single purpose, po probably single single instant, uh, single process even. Uh, but sometimes multiple processes, but very much single purpose. And so you don't have to worry about interdependencies necessarily of uh, you know, this monitoring agent. Again, you know, a lot of these processes that you want on every node, they have dependencies. They have Ruby dependencies and Python dependencies and things like that that might break uh, whatever it is that you're actually trying to do. And so with Docker, everything is containerized. Everything sort of, all the concerns are separated. And so you get a working container, you know it's going to work. Uh, and, and that's definitely great. And, it work, and it's also helpful uh, for performance reasons in that you don't need on every single one of your instances to have the monitoring agents and whatnot uh, running. You can just run them on the Docker host, similar to the, the original, very first slide deck here where they were showing that the OS doesn't have to run on every single container. You know, it's just running once, and then you're sharing that for all of your containers. So big performance gain. Uh, so those are the, the four big things that we like better about Docker. Uh, and, and areas in which we're looking to replace Chef. Uh, it doesn't do it all. Um, we're still looking to use, like when it comes time to actually spin up a new Docker host, you're not gonna use Chef for that, it doesn't even make sense. So we're still figuring out that. We're still using Chef for that for now. We're still using Chef and Prod. Um, but where are we currently using Docker? Uh, dev environment, uh, as John said. Uh, we've deployed internal support sites, some Flask apps. Uh, there's a couple other ones now. Uh, various things that are kind of annoying to, whenever you create a new internal tool, you don't want, have to necessarily go through a big, long, complicated process to create a, you know, you don't want to have to uh, have everybody that wants to create an internal tool and deploy it learn Chef. Um, lots of solutions to this. One of them is that off all you need to do is uh, you create a Docker file and know that some continuous integration process somewhere is going to build it and make a container, you're in good shape. Um, so what's next uh, for Docker with us? Uh, so we are actually this week working on something very similar to the zero downtime thing presented earlier uh, with Docker containers to run our web app uh, and then a Apache container on the same host and basically you know, a, a single Docker host that's just expected to be basically a node in our, our, uh, our web architecture. Uh, and it's gonna have, you just use Apache to effectively do the, the roll over from one container to the next. So you've got one running container, you deploy code over here, continuous integration runs, builds a new container. Uh, the host over here is gonna pull down that new container, spin it up, once it's up and healthy, attach it to the, as another backend on Apache, remove the other one, the first one, stop it as needed, whatever, and now you've got yourself a nice zero downtime deploy. And this is for a single node. We still have a load balancer, like we're used at Amazon, so an ELB is sitting outside of that. Uh, so it's, uh, it's something that is going to work pretty well for us, pretty seamless to, to integrate this uh, with what we're currently doing. Uh, this is also great. Uh, what we're starting to do next is look to create, uh, to be able to spin up a test environment per branch. We had sort of explored this with Chef a few times uh, to say, okay, and we, we kind of have the scripts. It ends up being kind of a really long script to say spin up all these nodes and uh, whatnot, and, and we kind of have it, but it's not very on demand, it's not very fast, uh, and so what we're planning to do is, you've got a branch of code, you want to see that in a production environment, you can probably do it now as we're expanding the stuff, uh, expanding these Docker files, you can do it on your local host and your local VM, but if you don't have enough memory or you want to load more data or whatever, we, we'll be able to spin up per branch test environments in, uh, uh, in prod, or well, in, in Amazon, I guess. Uh, and then monitoring is something that uh, isn't uh, super well covered by our existing stuff at this point, where monitoring all of the, those individual containers uh, and really tying back metrics to the right things and, and debugging these things is something that we're still learning on. Uh, we're looking to push those LXC metrics to StatsD basically and we use Datadog, which is great. Um, and then wish list, uh, one of these things I saw recently being tweeted in, alpha, in an alpha state is these trusted builds. Uh, right now, the Docker registry, a lot of times you look and you find a, you know, you search the Docker index for a specific image and you'll find it, and it'll say it's Redis. Might not say the version, doesn't really say, you know, doesn't really give you the Docker file to know what was installed or any of that. With the trusted builds, 
uh, it looks like you're going to basically see the Docker file and know that that Docker file is what was built. Uh, so you have a little more peace of mind in knowing that there's not just arbitrary binaries that you've pulled down and are running. Um, so that'll be great. Uh, linking is going to get presented, I think, shortly. Uh, currently, it's single host. Multi-host linking would be awesome. Uh, and along with that, actually, some centralized way to manage that. There's some third-party stuff with Shipyard and a few others that are pretty nice, um, but it'll be awesome to get a very well-supported uh, centralized host management. Uh, and then just little things like the ability to cache adding, the cache the actual files you're adding into the container, uh, being able to name your ports, uh, uh, just for friendly name reasons, and then one just some little tiny things like a name right now is globally unique, and even when you stop your container, it uses up that name, and so in order to recover that name, you have to RM the container. And so for our dev environment and those linking thing, we have to like defensively make sure that we've tried to remove a named container before starting up a new one with the same name. It'd be nice to maybe just say override.